details from Sierra Leone, which most of you know is one of the hardest hit countries in Africa that has the Ebola virus. Also, as a political scientist and Fulbright scholar, she has researched and published on gender, development, democratization, and post-conflict reconstruction in Sierra Leone. Her most recent work on women parliamentarians in Sierra Leone appears in the Journal of African and Asian Studies. She's also engaged in public policy analysis with the aim to reform government structures and to promote institutions that will ultimately provide space and empowerment to women in Syria. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Makoma Hill. Of, of 
initiatives. Second, I will look at the health, uh, the state of health in Sierra Leone and the role of the state in, in health. Third, I will look at the implications of both the international and the national in terms of citizen state relations. So how do these two um, how do these two <coughs> issues drive the ways in which citizens have interacted with the state and what implications does that have for the spread of the disease? So starting first with the definition of governance. When I talk about governance, I'm looking at it from Sacred Children have a, a definition that captured very well what I would like to, to do in this discussion. First, the governance is many factors. It's not simply one factor, it's several factors. We're looking at whether the system is decentralized, to whether there are existing protocols and guidelines in place to respond to different diseases. Are there protocols and guidelines at the national level and the international level? And what are these protocols? How has government um, been able to drive an effective reform agenda? Is the government able to drive an effective reform agenda? And if not, why not? What are the hindrances to government's ability to have um, a reform agenda that addresses the needs of citizens in preventing this, this disease. Third is this idea of participation in government. So taking it from the international to the national to civil society, what role do citizens in Syria have to play in all of this? So at the international level, where I'm going to start, I first want to look at the liberal post-conflict reconstruction agenda. In Sierra Leone, as I've mentioned, as a success story, much of the interventions that were implemented in trying to get the country from conflict to sustainable peace are ones that are largely driven by the international community. Not only is it driven by international governmental organizations and international non-governmental organizations, the emphasis has also been on stabilizing and strengthening political institutions. So of, of, of priority is security conceptualized in political terms. How do we ensure that peace, that you have sustainable peace? One is to demobilize, disarm, and reintegrate. So target ex-combatants, get weapons away from them, and get them um, in economic producing activities, and reintegrate back into, into society. Secondly, there's been this focus on security sector before. How do we make sure that the military, the police, the, the, the pillars of security sector are working in the interest of citizens? Third is the justice sector. How do we ensure that justice as well functions for the most vulnerable in society? So these are the key pillars of, of, um, of reconstruction that happen to be political institutions. Less emphasized has been health. Um, overall, that this doesn't mean that there is no focus on health. Health, international actors have talked about the importance of health, but this has not translated in, into actual programs that put health at the center of interventions. This is, this is the problem because links have been made between having effective service delivery and citizen trust in the state. One of the reasons behind the Civil War from 91 to 2002 is that government was not seen as very relevant in citizens' lives. That when people followed the government, it was more in terms of a force that was extractive, um, a, a, a force that was authoritarian, and, and not, very, um, not very instrumental in terms of providing development for them. And so initiatives, scholars have argued that you need to bridge that gap. And the way to do that is by ensuring that government is able to effect, to provide effective service delivery. So there is literature that talks about this, but it hasn't been really the emphasis when it comes to post-conflict reconstruction. It hasn't translated necessarily in practice. Robert Paley, um, a scholar from SOAS, has argued has, has said that while the country is most affected by the Ebola outbreak have been urged in the past to prioritize conventional macroeconomic policies of liberalization, privatization, and deregulation, they have not been similarly supported to build strong public health systems as a development of parenthood. So essentially this is covering what I've said. That yes, there's recognition that it's important, but that hasn't been translated in terms of the money. You know, to show me the money. Okay, so what, how much is actually going into healthcare reform? 
it hasn't been that um, it hasn't been that much. There has been some increase in external health related aid. 93 million in Syria, 89 million in Liberia, a little less in Guinea, 46 million. But when it comes to translating this amount into concrete, um, concrete programs that can truly address the impacts of the population, this has been this has been lacking. There's been, um, in addition to the, the amount of being sufficient, there's been people have pointed to the lack of of the the, the serial state of taking a driver's seat when it comes to putting in place what should happen with this money. So given that the international community is instrumental in terms of, of providing assistance, they're also instrumental in directing where these systems go and how these systems is used. So this has been a problem in, in terms of the state not being able to set the agenda. Much of the um, uh, priorities when it comes to certain diseases will be the big main ones, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria. These are areas that have received the bulk of assistance. And, and so these are targeted, these are targeted, specific to particular diseases rather than uh, focus on strengthening the health system as a whole. So that's been an issue. The other thing is that, which is what I, um, the other thing that has been pointed out is that there's been preference placed on infrastructure um, rather than uh, um, the investments in staffing. And so scholars such as William Easley will argue that for donors, in order to justify the money that you're spending, you need to be able to, sh to show, I built X amount of buildings. <coughs> this, this looks good. This is something tangible. Um, as opposed to talking about how many people have been trained. So again, the Eurodac report points to problems because there's been a gap between what's needed uh, versus what's actually implemented. The other problem that has been identified is that because you have a range of donors, a number of them, different competing interests, bilateral, multilateral um, sources of funding, there is a lack of coordination. There's a lack of duplication. There's confusion over who's doing what, who's acting, who's, who's, who's directing, uh, who's in charge of which area, who's doing, um, who's responsible for, for this versus who's responsible for that. And what happens when you have duplication and a lack of coordination is confusion. Um, so the, the, the healthcare sector is an amalgamation of NGOs, of faith-based organizations, of private clinics, um, with one another, um, both for, for, for funding as well as for, for clients, for customers. So there's not a cohesive, centralized healthcare structure. And all of this obviously was going to have implications once we were here. The free healthcare initiative that the Serial State implemented in 2010 is a good illustration of some of the problems that we see with having so many donors uh, in, in healthcare. One, it was implemented in 2010. It's a great initiative. Due to the free, as a result of free healthcare, the initiative said that pregnant women, lactating mothers, and children under five were to receive free healthcare. So a laudable scheme, a, a, a great step towards trying to ensure at least for the most vulnerable amongst the population. In practice, though, the state did not have sufficient income, sufficient funding to implement this. And so it relied very heavily on donor, um, on, 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 on funding from donors. In addition, you did not have, um, because you didn't have corresponding expansion of government capability and donor money is, is not infinite, this led to a rise in demand that was not met with uh, improved access in terms of what people can, can have using healthcare. So yes, there was an expansion. You know, don't get me wrong. This, this, there was some expansion in how many people did access it, but the system was overwhelmed. It was too much, too soon. And what and, um, I've done some some studies, some interviews with um, with recipients back in 2010, a couple of months after it came out, and then also some interviews last year 
with um, recipients of free healthcare, in which people have talked about the difficulties that they've had. One, that it hasn't been free. Even though it's supposed to be free, they've gone to places where user fees have been illegally implemented. Two, med the medicines that they need aren't freely, aren't freely available. And what, what's happening, and I'll talk a little bit about this when, when I go to the governor's component, what you have when unscrupulous, if you like, um, people in clinics who were actually taking the drugs and then selling them on the black market. And so you didn't have enough drugs, or you might have the very basic drugs, but not drugs for more complicated issues. So this was a, a problem. So you have a rise in demand, but then this is tapered a little bit because the access has not met the, the rise in demand due to the unavailability of drugs, unavailability of the uh, poor resources, as well as uh, effective corruption. So that's on the international side. Let me take this now into the state on health and where the state, what the state's perspective is on healthcare. On paper, this we see that the Serbian state recognizes the importance of health. Sierra Leone is amongst uh, one of the uh, African countries that, has, uh, that is part of the Abuja Declaration. And the Abuja Declaration, um, this is during a meeting that African countries, uh, African heads of states had to address the, to the challenges faced through by HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, as well as other related infectious diseases. And at this uh, meeting, they pledged eventually have 50% of the national budget be spent on health by 2015. However, as we'll see in a little while, this is not been met. The two poverty reduction strategy papers, these are the papers that the state develops to, to outline its plan for development. Both the one that uh, President Gorma, our current president, the one that was developed right after he took um, power in year 7, uh, PRC 2, said that human development was a priority. Effective delivery of basic social services is essential for ensuring economic growth and poverty reduction. That's from PRSV2. This theme continues in PRSV3. Here, again, in Pillar 3, improving the health of the poor, particularly women and children, is an investment in economic and social growth and development, and a priority for reducing poverty. So on all fronts, we see that in theory, health is a priority. Health is important and the government wants to do something about it. The National Health Sector Strategic Plan of 2010-2015 that was developed in 2009 is a framework that was also developed by the state to guide um, both the, the Ministry of Health as well as partners to make sure that health um, related development goals would be attained. And of course the free healthcare initiative that I just mentioned. So you can see from these uh, into initiatives that help, at least on paper, is something that the state says is important. In practice, too, there was a little bit of improvement. So, the government did spend some money in recruiting more medical practitioners from 71 to 64 in 2009, and moved up to 81 25 in 2010, so a 30% increase. Um, moreover, the first year of the free healthcare initiative, health worker salaries were, in, were increased. About 30% of donor funding did go to increasing health worker salaries. But, always a um, Budgetary allocations were consistently under 15%. So even though, as we saw from the Uta Declaration, this was a, this is an aspiration, the country has been slowly moving up, but is, is far from at that 15%. In 2012, um, it was 6.8. And in 2013, 7.5% of the budget was allocated to health. However, even these figures are a little misleading, and that's because there's disparities between what is allocated and what is actually spent. So what one wants to do in theory is not necessarily matched by what happens in practice. And you can see here that in 2010 projected, um, that there's a discrepancy between what's budgeted and what's actual. So, for example, out of the 118 million euros, 27 million dollars uh, that was budgeted in 2012, actually um, only 15 million of that was, was spent. And 
And so rather than the $16 per health that WHO talks about, what you had was $2.5 per, per no, two point, um, two and a half dollars per person that was spent on health. Staff, I mentioned that, that there were some steps taken to increase the number of medical staff. Despite that, you know, many steps should be should be acknowledged, but the number, the overall number of medical staff is still very, very low. You have 1,017 nurses and midwives in all of Syria, one health worker for 5,390 people, which is, is, is obviously uh, insufficient. To compare countries like the United Kingdom would have one health care worker for 88 people. Additionally, we have one doctor. 50,000 people. So you can see that the, the, the balance, the, the ratio between workers and citizens is quite, uh, is quite distorted. So all in all, despite the attempts that have been made, both by the international community and the state, the health statistics necessary prior to all of this, 2012, 2013, were not very good. Um, Syria has the world's lowest life expectancy, 45 men, 46 women. The worst infant mortality rate, one in nine children dying before age one. The worst uh, child under five rates, and the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. And this is despite the introduction of the Free Healthcare Initiative. And IGR found that there were 42 nurses that were working at the referral hospital, and the referral hospital was serving at least 500,000. So 42 nurses for 500,000. There were, and the, the majority of them were nursing aides and volunteers, so not even paid staff. You had one functional ambulance that was, had been donated by IRC, um, that served the maternity ward, and then you had three that were scrapped that were not functioning. You didn't have electricity, the generator wasn't functioning, um, the, the water companies <coughs> supplied water about three times a week, so you didn't have regular water supply. You had three stretchers that were shared amongst 10 wards. You had 30% drug availability. Um, and then a cooling system, because given electricity and, and problems with refrigeration, you couldn't preserve particular drugs that needed to be stored under cool conditions. So um, in 78 days, Panama went from zero infections to 394 infections by September 14, 2014. So you can see the direct implications of poor healthcare in terms of what happens when it comes to um, the to Ebola and the spread of Ebola. So let me turn now, I like, just to give you sketched out a little bit what the healthcare situation looked like. And I touch on the government, this, this issues of government at the state level. So I just want to, to, to expand on that a little bit. There are, despite attempts to improve we still suffer from insufficient resources, poorly equipped facilities, as I just mentioned, uh, looking at the Kenema case study. We have a health sector that is, is, is subject to corruption, um, fiscal and health care mismanagement, and accountability issues. So that this, this is not a secret. There are, in, you know, there's poor resources, but in addition to poor resources, there's poor management of the resources as well. And this combined together. Um, is not a good, it's not the best. This is symptomatic of a larger problem. So, this is not just in healthcare. At a larger level, at a macro level, there have been studies that have pointed to governance issues, entrenched governance issues that remain in Syria. So, for example, Transparency International, this was, the state did quibble on this, but TI, um, in 2013, said that Syria had the highest incidences of bribery in Sub-Saharan Africa. The African Monitor, which um, conducts studies on, on politics and governance in, across African countries, also conducted a study in Syria and found similar things when it came to questions of, of, of corruption. Um, the difference too with the Afrobarometer, they're actually asking citizens, how many times do you have to bribe? Do you feel that you have to bribe in order to receive services? So they're, they're getting citizens' perspectives on levels of bribes of police or of politicians um, in terms of people getting access to services, and, and citizens <coughs> quite high rates of that. 
the government, the, 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 these results haven't just been from external studies. The government has also found through the public expenditure tracking survey, this is one of the, the ways in which the state is trying to keep track of what's happening when it comes to resources. So this is a, a, a laudable um, scheme. PETS has found that there is a recent inefficiency in the service delivery system. We also have an auditor, um, auditor general, so the, 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 there are regular audits that are conducted of, of, of parliamentary activities, of financial activities, and that too has found that there is waste and inefficiency when it comes to, um, to service delivery, all leading to financial loss in, in, in various ways. So governance definitely is a problem. This has leaked into, over into the Ebola fund management. I'm not sure how many of you that saw a recent report by the BBC, which has been heavily publicized, that has talked about the mismanagement of Ebola funding. And this, there has been backlash to this. One a, a media a journalist wrote, oh, I'm sure Liberia is not looking at this, because if you're, if you're airing this kind of dirty laundry, you might make people hesitant to, to contribute to Ebola funding when we still do need Ebola funding. But um, according to her report, she found that one third of the Ebola budget was unaccounted for, so they couldn't trace where that money was going. There were no receipts for um, huge sums of expenditure. She, uh, the Auditor General is a woman, uh, lives in appears. She also mentioned that there was procurement of major um, um, major resources without proper vetting, without competitive bidding. And an example that was provided for 20 ambulances that were procured from Dubai. And of these 20 ambulances, each one costing 50,000. 16 arrived, but nobody quite knows where four are. Um, and then not just that, but of the 16, there were questions that have been raised as to how fitted these ambulances were for the job. And so concerns have been that they don't have the right equipment. They don't have what's needed in order to, to effectively do their job. So this has not gone unnoticed. You have um, civil society organizations that have been up in arms. And so the, the picture that you see says, which means, take your hands off our money. You steal too much. You're too corrupt. Um, and that, that's been making the rounds on Facebook. Another one. Um, is this, which says, Ebola money is sweet, which is, yeah, Ebola money is she's pretty good. Um, so, and it's uh, money, smoking and drinking. Um, <laughs> so, no, no money is um, So, in September 2014, this is right here, this is last year, the ACC, that's the Anti Corruption Commission, and the Serial Police except the two vehicles that were loaded with rice for Ebola torch controls. So homes that have been um, around uh, Ebola cases that are quarantined in order to make sure it doesn't spread are able to have access to food. And yet this, these two vehicles were discovered you know, supposed to be for that purpose, but they were not heading to those homes and there was concerns about that. So the ACC was investigating the matter, um, as well as the police and alleged act of theft and corruption. So there are, and this is before the, the Auditor General's report which just came out last month actually. So, um, what are the implications of all of this? If you see that you have a state, again, that you do not believe is acting in your best interest, this is going to have implications on the level of trust that you have for that state. When citizen-state trust, relations of trust are, are not strong, that in turn is going to have some implication on how effective a government can be in terms of making sure they can handle a disease outbreak. Are people going to listen to you if they don't trust you? And then there are other issues that are related to that that I'll talk about. So coming back to the other half of Rome, because this looks at citizen perception. 42% of citizens believe that the country is heading in the wrong direction in 2012. 43% believe that the government flagship program for free healthcare was not working very well. Also, um, a study that the Institute for, Gov for Government Reform ran in August of 2014 that specifically looked at how, as pertaining to Ebola, found 
that 65% of respondents, which is really high, if you think about it, 65% of respondents prefer to observe a sick relative at home for at least one day before calling a medical officer or taking the patient to hospital. And if you think of how uh, catching Ebola is, that one day can, can, can be really problematic in terms of the spread of the disease. But this is indicative of how little trust people have in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Um, second is that only 35% of citizens trusted that the treatments provided by the government of Sierra Leone available in health care facilities were, were good. So that's again another low number, all of which combined um, show that people were very hesitant, very unwilling to take their loved ones into any health care facilities. This all will have implications on how the state responded to Ebola and how citizens responded to the state's discussion about Ebola. Um, and so when you, when you hear people saying that what's wrong with the people, why don't they want to take their sick to the hospital? Why are they keeping their loved ones at home and in danger? Why don't they realize how badly they're behaving and how much at risk they're putting people? You have to step back and think of the years of mistrust um, and, and, and sense of some benefiting at the expense of others that might lead to what seemingly appears to be irrational decisions. So one, one of the things right before when um, Ebola had just come out, people didn't believe that Ebola was real. And so the, and I, this came out very much in the newspapers where some would argue that it was a ploy to steal to, to get donor money. That this is something that, that uh, African, well, Sergio, and Liberia, and um, also say in Guinea, that the state had invented this in order to try to get more money, or um, that it was it was something that was invented by the West to punish, or to threaten, or to uh, to pre um, pre develop weapons of mass destruction. You know, so using Africans as guinea pigs. And, and again, you can see that this is reflective of years of types of relations with the, with the West, where the West is seen as, as exploitative and taking advantage um, in, in several different ways of, um, of African countries. A second um, issue that came about was because Ebola broke out in the government opposition areas, it was seen as a ploy to depopulate um, people interpreted poor government response to um, to this actual divide, to this um, uh, you know, to the, the political situation was politicized. It was seen as as opposition versus the, the government in power. A third component, which I think can I. I, I um, illustrated that I've discussed a little bit, is that there's a lack of trust in health structures and in facilities. And this has been, you know, this is, this is coming out, from, there's a number of reasons for this. One of which is, they're just, the facilities are understaffed, they're under resourced. There are people who have gone and haven't been able to get beds, or haven't been able to get um, the medicine if they want us to left to as well. So the fact that you don't trust the healthcare, the healthcare system is not surprising given one's experience with it. Um, there's also relationships of distrust between citizens in the state, which one could chase, um, one could uh, talk about the war. Part of this was, was one of the, the, the underlying things that led to the war. So the, uh, in, um, during the September lockdown, it was a three-day lockdown where people had to stay home and there was a house-to-house -house, um, information campaign. There were burial workers that were attacked during this time because people saw them, you know, you know people were very suspicious of, of, of workers. People were very suspicious of those uh, people who were coming under the guise of help, but who had affiliations with the state. Another problem is that people saw that the state was slow to respond to this, so it took two months before a state of emergency was declared. And then once the state of emergency was declared, you found that the um, it was heavily um, police, the police played an instrumental role. 
So this, again, is not the best way to endear uh, citizens to the state. When they see the role of the police, the, the role of the military, in terms of enforcing some of the control efforts. Um, one of the first things, the, the, the lockdown, you had curfews, you had quarantines, you also had mass cremation. This, given the sensitivity of burial practices, did not go down very well. Um, during the lockdown process, people were asked, do you really want to die? Do you want to kill your family? Don't conduct secret burials. And then they were told, those that conduct secret burials are spreading this disease. It is their fault that your friends and relatives are dying. They're destroying our nation and I, the president, will see that they're punished for their illegal, selfish behavior. So these are the types of messages which has a, a very heavy blame component as well as um, a military or well, force, you know, the use of the police uh, component to it as well. So this, um, next slide. The, the way in which the government initially managed the Ebola outbreak reinforced some of these issues of, of mistrust between the state and citizens, um, as well as uh, reinforced the problematic deficits that you had in the healthcare system to begin with. One that was blame oriented, that you are to blame for this, you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing while you're staying at home instead of bringing your loved ones to the hospital. Well, as, as mentioned, if you see the, the, the conditions within hospitals, and also with the type of disease in the world, even taking people to the hospital, given that there's no cure, people were dying. So there was fear that you're just taking them to be killed, that this, this is killing people. I mean, and this is just a, you know, unfortunate outcome to the type of disease that it is. But there's a culture, it ignores culture on several levels. One, we can talk about this culture of mistrust, where there's entrenched inequalities, we have few people benefiting at the expense of many. There's also an ignoring of, anthro of, of anthropology and anthropological understandings of why the disease um, started off to begin with. So, for example, the witchcraft played a um, a role in, in how people thought about how they contracted Ebola. It was seen as, you know, the witch gun. You, 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 you got it because of, of, of witchcraft. And so if it's related to witchcraft, then one way in which you get rid of it is not by traditional medicine, it's not by conventional medicine, you would go to traditional healers. Um, and so understanding that as one of the reasons why people go to traditional healers rather than simply saying, you just don't know what you're doing or you're, you're deliberately doing things that are endangering people. Having that kind of understanding would have been helpful. Um, burial practices, this prevalence of secret societies, and there's very um, ritualized processes associated with burial, where uh, there's washing of the body, there's, um, it has to be properly buried, it's not, you know, among some uh, secret society groups, but there's a belief that a body that has been improperly buried, that person will come back and go to you and you will not be able to have a safe rest of the place. So when they saw people being taken away from mass cremations, they would go, or, or mass burials, people would go um, at night time to try to retrieve those bodies to properly bury them in order that they had a, a resting place, a proper right resting place. So this is related to, to, to cultural practices that needed to be understood and that needed to be addressed rather than trivialized. <coughs> And there has been much more done now where anthropologists have been incorporated into many of these uh, interventions and, and there's been attempts to try to understand this a little better. However, it's still, um, it's still an issue. The uh, most, um, just this past week, one of the, um, one of the, the increased um, Increased incidences of Ebola has been traced to a man who fled from quarantine in Freetown to go consult a traditional healer uh, because of his concern that he wasn't going to get the right treatment in hospital. Another set of, 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 of numbers have been tracked to unsafe burial practices. So this this has not been internalized. These these problems are still. The other issue has been this absence of gender considerations. A uh, recent study was done uh, by Oxfam and then a group of women that's 
doing another study to look at the gender components of Ebola. And we found that there's 56% of 56.7% of women are contracting it as compared to 43.3% of men. So women are being infected. And there's a lot of literature, a lot of discussion about this, but it hasn't been quantified. Um, but there is now data that yes, indeed, women are being uh, uh, infected in greater numbers than men. And this is because women are traditional carers, you know, that's a traditional role that they play, and when people are sick, they're the ones that, that care for the sick. Women are also tend to be the ones that wash the dead. Um, and yet this hasn't been to, it hadn't been taken into account significantly when it came to sensitizing about Ebola and about levels of treatment. Often um, sensitization meetings would be held in the court barrier, open spaces where you had men, where men could come and women not necessarily would be able to come. Or they were on radio, which women might not necessarily have access to. So all of this had implications on how much women knew. There was a need to, to have more of a gender consideration and reach out specifically to women, so that wasn't done. So where are we now? Okay. Right up. Um, international commitments to date, there's been 4.3 billion that's been committed by bilateral donors. And this is in the three countries, Syria, Guinea, and Liberia. This is 15 times the annual national so it's a lot of money comparatively to what countries have been investing in their health. Also, the cost of dealing with Ebola is three times, this is an action aim report, it's just uh, Save the Children report that just came out in January. But the cost of dealing with Ebola is nearly three times the cost of building a universal health service in all three countries. And so this is a, a perfect illustration of a case where prevention is best than cure. That go ahead and spend the, the, the money that you need in order to create these uh, systems ahead of time rather than doing it on the back end when something like this happens. So one as destructive and as, as, as devastating as Ebola is, um, in much the same way people assumed after the war that the war was an aftermath of war and in, in post-conflict reconstruction there would be an opportunity to rebuild um, institutions, rebuild structures that would stand the test of time and would better connect citizens and the state, Ebola can provide that similar opportunity. It can help, um, you know, Sierra Leone, Liberia, I've talked, most, I've talked on Sierra Leone, but this I think can, can be uh, something that's applicable across the Commando River Union, across these three countries. We need to make long-term changes addressing the infrastructure and capacity weaknesses, obviously, that contribute to the spread. And this is, this is not rocket science. You know, people are saying this, definitely health systems, poor health systems were to blame, you need to strengthen them. How? I'll talk a little bit about that. The second thing is that you have to think local. Many times there are decentralized structures that are in place that were marginalized when it came to the uh, interventions. For example, you had um, paramount chiefs that passed by laws very instrumental in terms of preventing movement across areas. You had local councillors, these are a decentralized level of government that, would, that wanted to, to um, these are people that are close to their communities as opposed to parliamentarians who are often based in Freetown, although they are supposed to also be in their constituencies. And yet, decentralized structures were marginalized when it came to money. A lot of money was given to parliamentarians um, to spend, and that this is another issue. So we need to um, have an emphasis on long-term sustainability interventions and rethinking post conflict initiatives, greater emphasis on health, um, but it's not just money, because you can have you can throw money at a problem, but if you don't have good accountability, then it's like pouring money down a to this to, to use a cliche. You, so you have to think beyond funding, you have to think of, of, of um, accountability systems, and you also need to think about training. So one of the concerns has been a lot of new buildings have been built because to house all the patients. But what happens when all the doctors from, from overseas who have come, what happens when they leave? You need to have domestic uh, an increase in the health personnel that can start to do these things. And we need to invest in a more centralized system. So donors, yes, right now are throwing money into this. But the lack of centralization has been a problem, as we've seen with um, what's going on. Uh, 
in terms of health expenditure, rather than sort of relying on, on the international community, there have been a series of studies that have been done that talk about the problems of police and illicit financial flows. And so you have an illicit, the illicit financial flows can be defined as illegally earned, transferred, or utilized monies. And this, there's several avenues of this. You have illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. You have um, financial flows from extractives, where duty waivers have been provided to particular uh, um, mining companies without proper scrutiny, so it's at the discretion of whichever uh, political leader might be in, in that position at a time. Um, Bound in 2014, the Budget Advocacy Network reported that in 2012, $224 million of duty waivers were given to six mining companies, and none of these went through Parliament. And this is in the run-up to the election. So there is a lot of money that can be mobilized through curbing illicit financial flows. And this again, this is just this shows the implications between domestic and international because these financial flows are coming from companies that are investing from overseas. The second, in terms of thinking local, use decentralized structures, use paramount issues use local council, also build on local trusted citizens in message dissemination, in training, um, in, in, in getting across the message what needs to be done. Talk to them about how they believe people would best receive messages. Talk to them about the concerns that they think need to be addressed, rather than it be top down, which many of these interventions have been. In the picture, this is um, Russell, one of the, the groups that, the group that I mentioned that I, I work with. This is a coalition of women, about 15 women's groups across Sierra Leone that have come together and said, as women, let's see what we can do in terms of assisting. Um, and so they mobilize domestic revenues. Uh, I also fundraise here for them. Um, and they use this money to address AIDS orphan, um, Ebola orphans children who've lost their parents to Ebola. They've also used it to help families who've lost nurses. Um, currently, as I said, they're doing a study to find out, to record women's stories, to see how women have been discriminated and whether their experiences are different. These are women who have uh, survived Ebola. So build on local groups, and you've got self-help groups, um, you've got church groups, you've got mosque groups that are all working on this. So this isn't just people waiting for out, outside help. There's been a lot of local initiative that can be built on, uh, that can be integrated. A meeting that I attended on, um, so this is part of the work um, that, that I was saying that Bresson has done, operating hand washing facilities. So they went to, to the market women and helped them put in washing facilities there, talked to, went to women's houses. So rather than having meetings in open spaces where it might be problematic for women, going into women's houses face to face and meeting with them has been another way to make sure that, that you take this gendered approach that I, uh, I mentioned. The third thing is this whole point of accountability. <coughs> there is corruption. Yes. Yes, there is. Um, one of the things that I think pushes this is that well, there's, there's many, many different things. But quickly, one is that we have a very partisan um, political system. And so sometimes corruption is ignored, or theft is ignored because of the partisan lines. You, so you're going to support your political leader regardless because that might be of the, the ethnic group of the party that you support. Debunking these various issues, which is, she said when she read it, she was just blown away at how thorough, how impressive it was. But later it's come to find out he's actually an, an aspirant for to run for presidential elections from the opposing um, team. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Nothing might be as it seems. But even so, what my response is that at least even if he is running, the points that he made can still be taken. And we can still go forward with that. Um, in terms of civil society, I help the women's response against the bullying and the aggressor. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is uh, picking up on the last question here from Dr. Mandy about what I have been doing. Um, one of the things that we did was come up with a, a press release that we have.
had that were distributed at the UN Secretary Council's um, emergency meeting on Ebola, when UNMIR, the UN mission on Ebola, was deployed, to say that in UNMIR you have to take gender into account. This was back in September. And the letter got to the UK um, representatives, it got to the Liberian representatives, the Sierra Leone representatives, who then mentioned gender in their discussions. And then, um, through it, it's the networks that women have, we, I, was able, I was able to go to the, the Security Council meeting, thanks to someone who had an in with the Sierra Leone, who was in um, who's a, a high level position within the UN. So then I was able to get in touch with our representatives, who then gave me a high level pass so I could get in there and then give this letter. And we then, from that, were able to meet the, the delegation of the Sierra Leone women from this organization met with the UNMIR chief, um, David Navarro, when he was in Sierra Leone. And from that meeting, he agreed to appoint several of them to an advisory panel that would advise him in terms of anything that was gender related. So that way, we were able to get this idea that gender mattered. Um, so you, you have openings through civil society in this way, just with the connections and people saying that we're not just going to let this slide. After the, 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 attorney, the Attorney General report, there was an open letter that we did address to women parliamentarians to say, please, as women parliamentarians, listen to the voice of Sierra Leone women. And we believe that you need to take this up. You need to make sure that you network with other male parliamentarians and keep pressure on the, on the state to follow up on the reports of the uh, financial reports. Other civil society organizations have done the same. There were a slew of open letters saying, Do, you need to make sure that you don't keep this, you don't let this slide. You have to make sure that you keep on top of these people so that the heads will roll, essentially, rather than this just be swept under the carpet. So I think there is definitely a call for change. Uh, to the question about travel restrictions, um, a lot of, one of the things that um, the UN Security Council did was call for the lifting travel bans, because I, I don't know if you remember, but last fall there were a host of all these countries that were all of a sudden saying you can't come and, and imposing travel bans, which was problematic on several fronts, because if you, you had any workers that needed to go and you have travel bans and they can't go, or medications and things can't, can't go. That's not to say that there hasn't been horrible um, ramifications in terms of st stigmatization and stereotyping. Um, I know this might seem trivial, but you know, the, my, my sister got married, and people were supposed to come from Sierra Leone to the wedding, and then there was supposed to be a cruise after the wedding. But what happened was that because, because people were coming from Sierra Leone, the cruise line said to them, uh, call my sister, and said, You cannot have people from Sierra Leone at your wedding if they're going to come on this cruise because we're not going to allow you to come. Um, it, unless they have been quarantined for 30 days. And 30 days is beyond the 21 days of, uh, that's accepted. So the cruise company was able to make its own rules, one, and because of these types of stereotypes, so everybody that was on the cruise was called seven, eight, nine, ten times to find out who they, had they been around. Had they been around anyone from Syria? Because if they had, better not even think about it. So, so travel restrictions, yes, but beyond travel restrictions are these spill-on effects as to how people have been stigmatized. And also that comes out of the type of media coverage that you saw, which was awful on many levels, but that's a whole different tool. Um, the other thing, so in terms of international borders, Liberia, yes, Liberia, um, until a particular number of days before they could be cleared. How has Liberia done it? Um, well, they have heavy U.S. You know, the U.S. was there. Um, but Ebola has also been very interesting in terms of how people have responded. Because Guinea responded for, for France responded for Guinea, the U.S. responded for all Liberia, the U.K. responded for Syria and others. But um, I think that they they've also learned some of these lessons. They they Ellen Johnson certainly received a lot of terrible press on this, and she's a very darling in many ways, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's
great, it's wonderful that they have been, and we pray that the Syrian will follow in the footsteps very soon. Our borders have been open, and now um, I was reading in the news that there's going to be a lot of vigilance, so that the president said that they're going to really monitor potential areas where there could, there could be possible cross-transmission. Um, in terms of the orphans, it's again been quite ad hoc. Um, we have some orphans, you know, stigmatization isn't just here. There's a lot of stigmatization that families face in Sierra Leone. So the orphans, where families normally, which are the, the source of, of, of resilience, source of strength, they're the ones that welcome you, that have been resistant to giving people to the nature of any older. And so you have orphanages that have sprung up. There was one, a very admirable uh, gentleman who just passed away. This is going to be a, a, one of the consequences. Remember I said that Ebola is not just health, but there are many other components to it now that we are, are seeing more and more. And there's been, there's a lot of post-Ebola activities going on. So even though we're not there yet, there's been a lot of activity on this front to try and see how can we address some of these issues that are coming up. Um, keeping on top of Parliament, civil society, so I mentioned that a little bit, civil society is open letters, is, um, is, 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 is talking to citizens, they're on the radio, publicizing this, they're, they're urging people, um, that you need to stay on top of what's going on and, and how this is being used. Civil society are also carrying out their own studies in terms of how, how funding is being used. The OSIWA study that I mentioned is going to be addressing one component of this. One area is that it will be looking at service delivery, but in addition to service delivery, there's going to be a component where we're training civil society on, on um, how to best help people know about their rights and responsibilities and how to demand better performance from government. And then there'll be follow-up studies to see whether in communities where they have this training, are we finding that people are responding? The other component is that because you're publicizing how different regions are doing when it comes to service delivery, there's this hope that they'll be the very act of publicizing this will you name the machine. So regions that see that they're not doing so well, theoretically should be embarrassed uh, when they see how other regions are doing, and that can present some kind of incentive for them to also do better, in addition to, um, to having citizens be at the front line in terms of advocating for change. In terms of keeping the government honest, because that's a lot of money, and a lot of wealthy men are going to be enjoying their money and hiding it. So I was just wondering what is civil society's, um, what, what is their role, um, or what do they think of uh, keeping the government accountable and uh, transparent? Um, you know, some of us know that uh, President Carmen Hale, uh, quite recently, spent a number of months in Sierra Leone on the Fulbright teaching and research with her husband, also a political scientist, and with their three children. I'm wondering if she would care to comment on how the Ebola situation impacted on their experience in Sierra Leone, and especially on hers, since she is from there, and um, also whether um, after coming back from Sierra Leone, there has been quite a bit of... Department of Political Science, which is part of the 
University of Puerto Rico, and that was from 67 to 71. He also spent eight months in Ghana and visited the universities in Botswana, Cote d'Ivoire, Ethiopia, Kenya, Liberia, Nigeria, Senegal, Tanzania, Togo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Zimbabwe, while teaching on a Fulbright grant at the University of Ghana. And I think he went to Uganda too, because so when I went, he gave me a lot of information. I didn't know if he went there, but he definitely sold me on Uganda before I went. He's widely known in the area of global level political thought and foreign policy studies, educated at Colgate University, Harvard University, the University of Manchester, and the Hague Academy of International Law. Professor Madley has taught at several institutions. In 75, Dr. Mann founded the International Public Institute, a nonprofit entity which has had a consultative relationship with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations since 1984. He edited an annual journal published by the Institute during the period of 1976 to 1981, and that was titled International and Com Comparative Public Policy. He is the author of a book on Guyana's translation to independent status. It's called Guyana Emergent, the post independent struggle for non independent development. That was published in 1979. And he's done various other publications in the field of international law, public policy, and related areas. Dr. Mann has taught political science and related subjects at Morehouse and Stone Colleges, the University of Puerto Rico, Medford Edwards College. University at, at the University of uh, City of New York, the University of Ghana, Leon, the Chinese Foreign Affairs University, City Hall University, and New York University. He serves as director of Ford Foundation Finance Non Western Studies Program at the Atlanta University Center and as chairperson of the political science department at City Hall. He is a member of New York and New Jersey. Dr. A. Zachary Yamba is President Emeritus of Essex County College in Newark, New Jersey. The longest serving college president in New Jersey, he was affiliated with the college for four decades. Dr. Yamba is recognized as a catalyst for more than a quarter century of extraordinary achievement that defines Essex County College. An unrelenting advocate for the power and promise of education, Dr. Yamba's tenure was predicated on the enduring values of service, access, and excellence. Born and raised in Ghana, he was educated at Weneba Teacher Training College in Ghana and Seton Hall University. He, aimed he earned his doctorate in higher education administration in the Pacific States University and Brunel University in London. Dr. Yama is an active member of St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in Newark, New Jersey.